Hello and welcome. I'm Rob adler Pekarar. I am the Executive Director of Yiddishkeit, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the latest in our series, In Conversation with Artists and Thinkers, whose work has deeply impacted the work we do at Yiddishkeit. So for those of you who have been following the course of this series, you may spot several intertwining thematic threads that link all of these artists together. And following on the, on the heels of last week's conversation with uh, singer Anthony Russell, as well as our previous discussions that we had with Frank London and with Michael Alpert, it seems especially appropriate to bring Yiddishkeit's founder, Aaron Paley, in conversation this evening with the amazing Tamar Rogoff. And the very seed of the concept for Yiddishkeit was planted in 1994, when Aaron witnessed the site-specific performance piece that Tamar created in the old country, in Der Alterheim, in Ivye, Belarus. And I know Aaron and Tamar will have a lot to discuss about that project, but I just want to underscore how the ideas and themes of that performance continue to resound for our organization, for the participants of Yiddishkeit's programs, and for the global audience that comes into contact with all that Yiddishkeit now inspires and produces and broadcasts into the world. So over the past three decades since the IVIA project, it, Yiddishkeit has continued to draw inspiration from the rich landscape of Central and Eastern Europe and to help inspire new works of art and culture that have roots in the same soil. Although some of these projects of ours have been halted recently, first by unrest in Belarus and then by global pandemic and now by war, We've spent the last 11 years creating programs and fellowships that bring scholars and artists to the very towns and regions that were the cradle of Ashkenazic Jewish culture and the very places where Tamar's project unfolded to see the way, as James Joyce once noted, that places remember events and to evoke old memories and create new ones that become the raw material for new works of art. And the word inspire feels especially meaningful tonight, since we'll be hearing more about the very inspiration for our, our organization. But it's also so fitting in the work we do, since the etymology of that word stems from the word spirit or the breath. And our purpose at Yiddishkeit is to engage directly with this realm of spirits, with the breaths of our ancestors and forebears as they can be attended to and observed in the places where these spirits lived and perhaps continue to be present and in and through the Yiddish language, an instrument which was breathed into life by the breaths of those who came before us and that can be reanimated by our own living breath. So I'd like to get our conversation started this evening by bringing in my friend, Aaron Paley. You may know him as Yiddishkeit's founder and visionary and dapper culture maven, as described by LA Weekly. He is also the president and co-founder of Community Arts Resources, our city's unparalleled innovator in urban planning, cultural programming, event production. And he is always on the forefront of connecting people and community and place. Welcome, Aaron. Oh, thank you, Robbie. That was a beautiful introduction. Really. Well, it's so great to have you here tonight. And let's also bring on Tamar Rogoff. Uh, Tamar is a choreographer and a filmmaker who explores the outer limits of how people negotiate extreme circumstances and her deeply personal large scale site works, her films and her proscenium performances. They all explore a mix of collaborations, bringing together people across generations, as well as professional artists with community participants. And her work has been presented both nationally and internationally at, at venues as grand as the Kennedy Center and the Estonian National Opera, and also in such accessible places as New York City sidewalks and rooftops. So welcome to you, Tamar. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it's wonderful to have you both here with us tonight. Um, and I'm so excited to listen and I'm going to leave the two of you to talk, but for our audience out there, please feel free to drop your thoughts and questions and comments on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching. And I will pass along those to Aaron and Tamar and, and they can respond to them over the next hour and a half or so. So thank you both Tamar and Aaron, and I will see you later. Wow. Well, that was fun. That was like, I feel like I, I'm inspired just by, by what he said, but I am so happy to speak with you tonight, Tamar. And thank you so much for joining me. I, I know this has been years in the making, just this conversation. Yeah, 
I can't wait, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I know. And we've actually been, uh, Tamar and I, uh, with Yiddishkeit, with Lisa at Yiddishkeit, we've been talking extensively beforehand just to kind of prep ourselves for this. But in many ways, we don't need any prepping because um, I, I, because when I first met Tamar, I think we became friends, fast friends, and we've been friends ever since. But mostly I've been looking to you for inspiration and I was incredibly inspired by you and continued to be. So I wanted to just start out by thanking you so much for, for bringing so much to me and the audience is gonna see that very soon. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So I'm, I want to start this off by just uh, giving a little more flesh to what Robbie was saying. So I got a phone call from my good friend, Elise Bernhardt, who uh, was the director then of Dancing in the Streets in New York. And she said, well, I'm working on this thing where we're going to give money to artists, to choreographers to create site-specific dance all over the world. And um, I got to sit on the panel that reviewed those applications and your application came in and it was something about trees and people were going to be in the trees and it was a shtetl and you know i read it and i and i was i you know we approved uh funding for you and then later like i a year later or i'm not sure how much longer later um at least contacted me and said i can't go to the performance that tamar is doing in in Belarus, which for me sounded like the moon. And she said, uh, so can you go as a site visitor on behalf of the funder? And I said, can I bring my wife, Judith? And she said, sure, you, sir. So I, I said, I'm on. So I had a free flight to go to the, to the old country. And I had never been to Eastern Europe. I had grown up um, thinking about Yiddish and, and uh, I've talked about my education in other places. So for me to go to, to fly into Vilna or Vilnius uh, to meet you at the Opera House uh, was just like a thrill. It was, I was so excited and, and it was so amazing. And then what, when we went eventually a, a, a couple days later to Belarus and then to Ivy and I saw what was happening there, I... I actually, this, as my as as my wife says to me, she said that she could see the light bulb going off of, above my head. Like I had this idea, and you came into my life at a certain point where I was searching. I didn't even know I was searching, but I had had this feeling about my own history and my own past. And all of a sudden, you showed me a path which I didn't know existed, which was contemporary artists and how they would deal and could deal with our past and with our present and with our future. And that was the, the Ivia project. And that literally, like coming to see you for the first time and to see the piece left a, a lifelong impression. And, but most importantly, it said to me, I came back to Los Angeles saying, this is how I need to proceed uh, to, with my own life. I need to create something to celebrate um, to celebrate Yiddish in a way like Tamar did. And, uh, and so I came up with this idea and I, met, I created, a, I brought together elders in Los Angeles and I said, we need to celebrate Yiddish in a contemporary way. We need to use contemporary artists. We need to make this something that, that people that isn't just for our bubbas and zetas, for our grandmothers and grandfathers, but are for our kids. And, and contemporary art is the way to do it, and that's how Yiddishkeit was born. So I just wanted to give our audience the sense that literally this is the genesis, like, and you are, um, you are my inspiration, and that, that's how all of these things have started. So thank you. So that's the, the general introduction. But what's been fascinating to me, and I'm just like, I'm gonna let you speak now, is like, you definitely, brought what i found out is that you are this incredibly rich person and amazing artist who has so many layers and you've talked about your work as a, a way for you to understand yourself to understand your family to understand your neighborhood and your community so like just how do you think this first project of ivia fits fit into your life and how how did it change you oh good question um it definitely did uh, it was a mammoth project, you know, starting with a very simple idea. And um, maybe I'll just tell everybody, like, 
how the project started, and then you'll understand um, what it meant to me and how formative it was. Uh, so in the 1990s, very early on, I was working, um, just as the Soviet Union was breaking up, I was working in Estonia with dancers and, uh, and in Lithuania, and there were new companies forming besides the ballet companies. And one day, you know, I had heard as a kid that uh, I came from Ivia, and my father was born here, but my grandfather and my uncles and aunts and there was always the feeling that Ivia was a place of great learning. All these amazing novels were translated into Yiddish. And there were political groups. It just sounded like, like I came from the most wonderful, wonderful place. And um, so I remembered Ivia. And when we were sitting in Lithuania, some of the dancers said, well, why don't we just go? <laughs> I was like, oh. And so we crossed the border into Belarus. Um, I think the next day it would have been too late. The border would have been closed. All this is about one window of opportunity to do what we did. Um, so we went there, and there's this dirt road town, and an apple seller is sitting there. And to my translators, my dancers, I say, where are the Jews of the town? And she points, and there's a guy standing behind a picket fence. He's waiting for me. It's like he's waiting. And he, I say Tamar Rogoff, and he hears the name Rogoff, and he practically jumps out of his skin. He's so happy. And just within a few minutes, like all the Jews, all there was something like about seven Jews left there then. They all gathered. I was eating a meal. I was being fussed over. And um, then at just one moment, uh, one of the older women, Sonia, said, after they told me what wonderful my family was, would you like to see where they are? And... I was like, oh, okay. Um, and they took me to this forest and they showed me these mass graves where 2,500 people were, you know, were buried. And she had a book and she read out 29 names with the last name Rogoff. I have those names. Um, and a little bit about each person. And <laughs> Who's going to believe me? But I had no idea that my family had anything to do with the Holocaust. I had, I was in such shock to know that I had lost all these relatives, um, and you know, so it was kind of a shock and hard to absorb. And so I went home. And then there was this thing from Dancing in the Streets that said you could go anywhere and do, do anything. And I thought, well, if I'm going to mourn for these relatives, I have to know them. And as I'm not much of a scholar, I'm a very, I learn, <laughs> I learn through my body. I learn, um, you know, just having, being somewhere, talking to people. That's, this is my method, very experiential learner. I decided I'll go over there and I'll do a little piece that commemorates them. Well, that that little piece <laughs> turned into this very very big piece, um, and that's that's that was how it was. And what I was trying to do, at some point, and Aaron knows about this. My father had written a story, and uh, this he in 1935 was in Berlin because he was a New Yorker, but he was Jewish, and the quotas didn't let him go to medical school, so he went to Berlin. And he was really a, a musician, so he's playing in all the piano and all the beer halls, getting beat up. And But in, in 1935, he decides, I'm going to go visit my grandfather in the shtetl. And he's there for a little while, and he writes this diary. And basically, the Avia Project was for me to recreate his experiences, you know, which were so beautifully written. He was so welcomed. So I wanted to walk through that forest and see what he saw. Was your father alive when you went to Ivia and came back? No. My mother came along as a translator. She speaks a lot of languages, but my father didn't. Mm -hmm. But it was lovely that, that his story, you know, kind of I mean, could have he ever known that this would happen? That would have mm -hmm. been really, really sort of something that would have made him really happy. But yeah, a lot I mean, of my relatives did come to see it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I actually wanted 
dive into some of your, like you, you started imagining what this has looked like. Could we see the sketch of the arrivals uh, that uh, Tamar did in advance of, um, of creating Ivya, the, the actual project? So tell us what's going on here. <laughs> so I, I made a map. I walked through the forest and I felt like I could, I could see things, small mm -hmm. little scenes. Mm -hmm. All the time very aware that the paths that I was walking were the paths that the Jews walked to their death. But not using that as directly, using just what I, almost like a child's wish to see mm -hmm. something be there again, to be part of it, to understand it, to know those people. And so I, I, I drew this map. and. Uh, this is Costas Smerigidis, uh, the actor, who is one of the most famous movie stars and stage actors and singers in Lithuania, even throughout the Soviet Union when it was, when it was that. Um, and he agreed, I saw him at the Joyce Theater, and he agreed to come and play one of my relatives. Um, so that's what the, this, this little book was made for me by the scenic designer who had all the sketches and, uh, you can see the watering can. Mm -hmm. This was this was his notebook. Mm -hmm. So I want to actually play the first uh, the clip, which is actually I want to go to the opening and welcome clip. Uh, we're going to play that first because I want the audience to actually get a sense because this is how I experienced it and how, how I experienced you. So let's uh, go to that clip and roll it, uh, and then we'll talk later when, after it's over. So this is everybody arriving. So you have Lithuanian and Estonian dancers and actors. You have children from uh, the local town and, and adults. Uh, you have the musicians, Frank London. Um, you have all the translators, the many producers. <laughs> I, there's Frank. Yeah, that was also the first time I met Frank. Uh, and I didn't even know who the Klezmatics were. And there's the bus that brought all the artists and, and people to the site. Who's that? That's uh, one of the actors from Lithuania. So, uh, and then I want to go right to the, to the opening and the third clip, the opening and welcome clip, uh, because it, that's where you, it kind of brings the, the sketch to life with Kostas. Let's do that. Шалом Алехам, добро пожаловать. Я очень рад вас видеть. Я очень рад. Nice to see you. Шла бы Ламинга, все смотри домас. Но я, я прошу, не входите пока. Я хочу быть уверен, что ваши сердца открыты, что ваши глаза видят все, что ваши уши слышат все. Каждый шелест этого леса, этого места. Послушайте все вместе. Этот ветер. Уинд. Ханы. Hanna Rogov, my best friend, he is a wonderful musician, wonderful. Не дрикши-то, не, не рельта, что прошел. Не делай этого, я тебя прошу. Ай, дай куплю, плиз. Не дрикши, не дрикши, то где? Эй, я! Вау. 
so there's so much going on in that. So you see Costas, and he's greeting us. And I remember being there and all these languages. He's speaking in all these languages, right? He's like, yeah. Um, I don't even know. I mean, Lithuanian, I'm assuming, and, and Russian and English, right? Yeah, it was tricky. I wasn't sure what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it kind of, I just watching it now reminded me of the, 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 the film that just won an Oscar, Drive My Car, which was like taking this Chekhov play and all these people speaking. And, and like, there were so many languages being used and, and the people, the audience came from all over, all over mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, right? Yeah, yeah. And we, we should uh, let everybody know that in Nivea, they sewed these green capes for me. Um, for the audience to wear so that they would blend into the forest because when the, <laughs> at the end of the Soviet Union there was they were allowed to have advertisements and everybody had Coca-Cola on their shirts and it was like Im impossible to, to see the forest. So that's why they're wearing the green capes and that is my daughter, my 16 year old daughter Ariel, who, who I call the girl from the present who jumps over the wall. And she and she's also not just the girl from the present who breaks. She so she breaks through the wall. She literally breaks through the fourth wall of performance. And you know the odd. She's as a spectator becomes part of the piece. But she's your family. She's yes. literally going back to discover her own family. Yes, by, she's having the same experience that I was having. She is yeah. discovering in that moment. Yeah. And she rips that. She takes off the cloak and says, "I'm no. I'm not part of this anonymous audience. Yeah. I'm actually part of the of of this piece. I mean, I, I, I it brings me to tears every time I I re-enter Ivia with um, watching it because it's so visceral, um, and so many things are happening there. And we enter into this amazing. Um, and you literally then start on this journey through, uh, through the forest. And um, and let's go to the to the rabbi procession, to that clip, because I just, I, I want people to just feel how beautiful this is. <laughs> Shalom Aleichem Rebbe! Добро пожаловать, как твоя дорога? Добро пожаловать тебе, Берл! Шолом дю, Берл! Айх, Рэбе! Айх, Рэбе! Шолом Айх, Рэбе! Шолом Айх! Шолом Айх! Шолом Айх! Шолом Айх! Everything about this piece is just so layered and so complicated and so simple. So, um, the, here's, I, first of all, you had people from all over the world who are learning about these traditions, right? Like these, the, and you you assembled this world class uh, ensemble that that literally came together to create this, right? Yeah, I mean, David Rogoff is not not a relative, actually. So the rabbi, he was sent to Siberia during the war. Um, you know, and then, then came to New York and was active in the Yiddish theater. And uh, so, you know, he was back in this country after all those years, since he was in Siberia. Siberia hadn't been back. But the, this part that I love about this is that I think it was uh, 1944 that Ivia was officially declared Judenrein, cleansed of Jews. And so it felt so wonderfully subversive and strong to bring it all back. Mm -hmm. Saying no, it wasn't. You know? mm -hmm. And um, so, to me, that that um, that scene was the Passover mm -hmm. seder. And and then it, the choreography is beautiful. The joyousness, the music, thanks to Frank London, yeah. is yeah. absolutely amazing. And then this ensemble of musicians who are playing live, and then uh, the 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 costumes. So what's like? What was the idea of like they open up and there's the well, Hebrew writing inside. <laughs> it's that they carry their prayers inside mm, mm. and um, they can show them. I, I mm. mean, it's just, for me, I just found the writing beautiful, um, uh, keeping it close to you. Really, nothing nothing um, terribly symbolic, but... Uh, but yeah. it, no, it just, it, it actually adds such a layer to it. And, and what we did is like every, so every scene 
we move through to a different place in the forest and experience the space. So we're viscerally, as an audience, we're moving through this space of, of death, of this space where people were murdered, where your family was murdered. And we're now actually, what, you're, what you, I believe you did here was you, you said, we're actually going to look at the lives they lived and not the death that they suffered. But actually, who were these people and what joys did they have and what sorrows did they have? At least that's what I Yeah, thought and when they disappeared, what else disappeared? This whole mm -hmm. culture that they carried. Um, Aaron, I think it would be great to maybe play a few clips in a row and just yeah. have everybody have the feeling. Yeah. And then maybe so just continue. Absolutely. Let's go to the children in Yiddish songs. And then we'll go to the card game. <laughs> Спектакле у меня была сцена учительницы. Я учила детей песням еврейским, учила их языку идеш. И когда мы пели с ними идеш, лидер идеш, песни, я вспоминала свое родное местечко, вспоминала всех тех, кто погиб. Как игра? Представляете, они начинают играть в понедельник, мангой. И что вы думаете, они останавливаются? Нет, они играют даже вторник. Они забыли дома, они забыли детей, они забыли все. Они играют, а Леди Керри, они играют в среду. Они играют в четверг. Они играют даже в пятницу. Они забывают, что шаббат. You know, just logistically, we're moving through the forest. The musicians are moving with us. You have all of these, I mean, it's so incredibly complicated. Um, and I just, it's hard to, for the watch, the person who's watching this to appreciate just how amazing it is. It's not a soundtrack. It's, li it's being performed live by an ensemble that keeps reassembling itself as we move to different places. And, and you also use people who not, who, who were survivors of, of the massacre itself and, mm -hmm. uh, and from Ivya, like the woman who was teaching the, the children's songs. I mean, where she was saying that she was reminded of her own town. Mm -hmm. She was actually from a neighboring town and then moved to Ivya. But, um, you know, all these people have, the people who were in it, there were like five survivors who performed um, and there aren't any that are still alive. So yeah. it's really that, you know, it's that part is, was also fortuitous to be able to be there. And they wanted to leave right after the Avia projects. That's when they all left for Australia. I mean, they just, some, some people just waited actually. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. In many ways, you, you brought closure to them by bringing this piece. They said they, they were waiting for me. They knew I would come. <laughs> but, but I think the really interesting part is, you know, uh, I interviewed a lot of people, and there is something called the Ivia Society here in Brooklyn, which were people who did manage to escape and came here, and they formed a society, and they would welcome other people who got here. Um, you know, from the early 1900s on, there was an Ivia Society here. And, you know, they told me a lot of stories, and they really, really expected and wanted me to portray the atrocity. and. And it was very hard for me to stand my ground and say, that is not a story that is mine. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to tell that one. I'm mm -hmm. going to tell the one of me looking for, you know, people, the people. I, I so, um, you know, and in the end, they totally understood. And, and um, yeah. And what I did was I said that if anybody wanted to write their story, I would publish a magazine, which I would give to the audience as they left. And that's what I did with a lot of poems. And so no one was, you know, 
no content was pushed away. But mm -hmm. I dealt with um, the happier aspects mm -hmm. of what was lost. I mean, well, I think that you 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 created something that's much more timeless in a way, and that 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 to me has much uh, greater resonance uh, because it's. Um, we often get caught up in in memorial i mean you we were in a memorial to death i mean that wall that ariel climbs over is actually the memorial um yeah. that was was built but by going deeper or further into the forest with you and by having the lives that these people live come come and appear before us as if they were as if we were transported back by some magic uh, you made it both much more i mean i'm just i'll never be able to forget it for my entire life it's just so incredibly powerful um yeah. and and everything that you do the layering of having these this ensemble i mean how many people were in the ensemble well i we were about a hundred people a day working on this um so maybe 35 so and a 35 with a crew of another 65. There's so it. many people who had yeah. to help us and Bonnie and Lynn and Arunas. Mm -hmm. and, but you, know, you also had like, you mustered the town. Actually, let's look at the, where is maybe it? We'll, let's look at the next, all the rest of the Ivy Eclipse and maybe okay. that would be clear. All right. Let's go. И очень много раз, когда я встречалась с детьми или с людьми, и не только вы, и в Лиде, в своей школе, дети, которые были, как тебе сказать, прикасались к этому, они совершенно по-другому начинают понимать. Они понимают, как много потеряно. И они понимают, что надо по-другому относиться к своему настоящему и к истории. Ваш спектакль мне очень понравился. Мне Тамара Моисеевна, мы соседи, вот Тамара Моисеевна здесь жила. Здесь она девочек своих Да, здесь она жила, мы соседи. Она лично ко мне в дом приехала и пригласила. И дети ходят и целуют. Ну не знаю, ну хулиганье. Надо людям показать, что были евреи, вы, что они были мастеровыми, 
что они были портными, сапожниками, что были лентяи, что были святые. Точно так же, как и все мы, которые там участвовали, мы жили там в этом спектакле, мы не играли. Wow, so who was just speaking just then? That was Sonia. Um, so just so that everybody understands, there was something called the Ivia Project that took place in the forest. And then there was a film, a documentary film of it called Summer in Ivia. So what you what you just saw, you saw clips of the actual performance, but then now you've seen you're seeing bits of the film itself. Um, yeah, and just go to my website. You can mm -hmm. have the whole if you film, if you like. Um, but that 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 clip we were just seeing took place because I was there. You you had this thing. Let's let's have all the actors and everybody in the ensemble walk into town in costume, right? Yeah. So it was like the Jews are coming back, and we're not <laughs> yeah. just going to be in the forest anymore. <laughs> we're coming into town, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and did you I, just decide to do that, or did you ha had you been no, planning on that, or I have, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I I find it so interesting that the the women that were standing there talking about you know, they later said what a windy day it was because <coughs> the women with the babushkas they're the townspeople who were there on the day of the massacre. Absolutely. They watched they watched through their windows as the Jews marched, you know, and here they were seeing this. Um, yeah, so so I, I think part of what was so wonderful about it was it had a lot of offshoots. Like it had Yiddishkeit, and then the um, Lithuanians made a beautiful film, which they, they uh, really tasteful with my permission, and they showed that on television. I don't know, six million people they said watched. And then the Belarusians just snuck in and made their film with a lot of special effects. And I took out Frank's beautiful music and put in Montevani. And I mean, <laughs> so it, there was, the Belarusians would watch it too. And, um, you know, there, there were a lot of ways in which um, there were things that happened because of it. Uh, and one of the things is that the memorial was made a little more safe. Mm -hmm. Because as the Jews left, there was no one to tend it. And, you know, so there was the feeling that, you know, maybe it was an important place. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it's a very important place. And, and it's so interesting because there was that moment in 94 when you did this. That was the moment when Lukashenko was, was elected as, um, as the head of Belarus, which um, actually him being, you know, be becoming dictator of that country for the 30 years that he's been there now, almost 30 years, it led to the consequences next door. I mean, at that moment, people could travel right. across. You had people coming from Kiev and Minsk and Pinsk. There were buses, right, coming of people bringing the audience from all over Eastern Europe to this. But and it was, I remember at the time that it was featured on television and like every every um, in every country, like Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, mm. uh, um, Ukraine. So it was such an amazing time that that it could happen then and it could could never happen now at this point right so i i'm really glad to have that film um because often with dance performances they completely disappear so but, you yeah. you like what what took me some um a while to understand is how did how you came to actually create this amazing piece and I mean, you danced, as you, you told me, you studied, uh, you danced in the Martha Graham Company. Well, not quite, because I was okay. not old enough. I, I went to the high school performing arts, and I was, you know, I danced, I studied with Graham, and, um, you know, I studied ballet, and, you know, I, I was a dancer until I was probably 30, mm -hmm. and then became a choreographer. But, but before, um, you know, after, you know, one of the things that, you told me about and in this brief talk was that you you were steeped in this modern dance tradition yeah yeah and then you had to throw it away and 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 part of that came through um through moving to india 
yeah, yeah. So, yes. So when I wanted to be a choreographer, I would go to a studio. I would rent the studio, and I'd walk around the studio, and I'd go two of two of this Martha Graham's, four of this Martha Graham's, two more of this Martha Graham. Oh, this is unique. I'll do one Martha Graham, and I did not have any vocabulary. I mean, I, I, from childhood, I was in that studio, and so I went to India, and I studied classical Indian dance, and you know, stayed for three years and uh, danced, danced for the Maharaja and performed for the tourists in the hotels and basically lived in India. And I think with, um, sometimes you think of that the Avia Project had like modern theatrical um, approach, but really it's in India that I really learned about community-based site work. Um, and so, Every year there's something where they read the Mahabharata um, and there's a, you know, a big cell, sort of, uh, it's, it's, you could call it a play, but it, it's, not, it's done every year and um, everybody takes play, the, the tailor is in it and all sorts of people, oh, okay. <laughs> and, you um, really passed here. <laughs> I really passed, I, I passed. But anyway, you know, it's a big field, Maharaja's Palace, and while Sita is doing something there, there's a wedding there, there's a, and you, as an audience member, you just wander around, all these things are happening in real time in different places, you can be where you want, and um, it's, that for me was so exciting. So and in mean, a they, way, they, they're actually doing the Mahabharata in situ or in in like outdoors. Yeah, it's at the, around the Maharaja's mm -hmm. palace. There, mm -hmm. It's different setups. And, and you're moving from year. place to place. Is this is this the first time you're experiencing site specific dance theater that you actually start to create yes, later? Yes, yes, yes. In India, there, where I lived in Benares, there were like 400 official holidays a year, and every single holiday had a pageant. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'd be walking down the street with my little boy and suddenly Krishna would come running blue, you know, and jump mm -hmm. into the water and mm -hmm. fight a snake. And, you know, it, it, it was just drama was all around us mm -hmm. and, and seamlessly, uh, you know, religion. It was like art, religion. It was all seamless in people's lives and everybody mm -hmm. knew, knew the mm -hmm. stories already. Mm -hmm. And that's something true of Ivia. Everybody who came there knew what had happened there, you know. So um, it just, yeah, I, I, I felt like in a way it was an ancient way of telling a story. Mm -hmm. No, it's so interesting because like um, I, uh, my wife and I went to Bali in 1990 and I had the same sense like that art, it was like a going to a society where art is integrated into daily life. And it's not, it's not, like the way we experience it in the United States, where you go to art, you go to that museum and you enter the doors, you go to the opera house, you and 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 art right. is over there and we're over here. And 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 that's also the way the Ivia project also worked as well. I mean, you didn't allow us to be sitting in our seats. Uh, art was around us and we were part of the art too. So it's so interesting because I we this I just learned this, like that that's you no, you're and and so not only did you discover this amazing dance technique and this amazing way of telling stories, um, this ancient way of telling stories, but it literally al allowed you, it freed you from the constraints of of kind of modern modern dance. But you also said it allowed you to start telling stories, or or maybe I'm putting words mm -hmm. into your mouth. But you you said you know like you never wanted to just use dance as an abstraction, but to, to be narrative. Yeah. Yeah, I think in all my work, I'm, I'm telling a story to learn something about myself, you know, and I always feel like I put my teachers in the work. And in this case, in Ivia, it was the, the survivors, um, although, there, I mean, and everybody else, of course. Um, and then The Daughter of a Pacifist Soldier, I did a piece about my dad, because um, during the time of the Holocaust, my father was fighting in Burma with the Merrill's Marauders, and I wanted to investigate what I felt was his PTSD, you know, so I did a piece with five veterans from different wars. And so I will always put myself in a situation where there's something that I need to know, I absolutely need to know, and I gather the site and the people 
who will inform me. And, and as a group together, um, we, we experience the, the well, question. Let's, let's, so let's, let's look at that clip of, from Daughter of a Pacifist Soldier. So, you know, as Shakespeare said, I screwed my courage to the sticking point, you know, and uh, kept going. And uh, in a sense, I was relieved when, uh, when I was shot down, you know, that it was over. And um, um, I was scared later, of course, as I told you, when I was with the, uh, the soldiers and they were sort of threatening to throw me off the cliff. And that was, and as I said, I just kept praying to myself, die like a man, die like a man, die like a man, die like a man. And um, scary, 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 scary. I, I didn't have a tremor. I had a, I, my whole body shook. Uh, it just wasn't a nervous tremor. It was a, uh, as I told you, I wouldn't eat out for a couple of years because my hands shook so badly. And, I, you know, I came back and I ran into a, a grammar school teacher of mine. This was when I was on leave before going down to the convalescent hospital in Georgia. And she said, oh, I'm so glad the war is over. Now we'll be able to buy sugar finally. And I thought, oh, lady, war is more than sugar. Mm. Who's, who's speaking there? That's John McCarthy. He was in World War II. So my company, they buddied for a year. They went to the um, Veterans Hospital. And there were two uh, men from World War II, one from the Korean War and two from Vietnam. And so the voice, you know, those interviews that my company did were made into, were edited into something they danced to. And I, I did choreography that I considered listening choreography. So what, the dance is meant to have you hear more, rather than often dances, you know, itself is what it, um, is front and center. But, um, you know, the thing I was investigating was that because of after Ivia, um, whether I had inherited my father's nervous system or the wars, you know, mm -hmm. and... You know, what does it mean to be related to, to Holocaust, you know, to the Holocaust? How much do we carry? And these um, veterans um, would never have talked to me if my father hadn't been in the war. I was NOK next of, of kin. And just the way in Ivia, no one would have talked. Really, they would not have understood why I was there if I wasn't actually connected. Um, you know, and I, they were able to say things to me that, to help me out understanding my dad um, that they didn't say to their kids. But then when it became a piece, they were speaking to their kids. And so it's this root of information, which was the same in the Avia Project, the same in, mm -hmm. in a lot of works that I do, where it's an indirect speaking that, that somehow, um, yeah, com comes, comes to... Um, to not only teach me, but uh, reflects out. Um, I know it's hard, you know, Aaron, it's so hard for me to leave the IFIA project and go on to other work because uh, when I look at you, I, I keep thinking of a lot of other things. But um, but the IFIA project really changed things. When I came back, I, I came back with the capes, I brought the capes home. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was really shocked because I had I had met my community in Ivia, and mm -hmm. I was one of them. But here I lived on the Lower East Side, Hispanic neighborhood. In the I moved here in the 1970s, and no one knew me, and no one really wanted to know me. Mm -hmm. So I I decided to do a piece in this neighborhood, mm -hmm. so that um, yeah. So, <laughs> so well, I mean, I, yeah. So the, you create Demeter's daughter. Yeah, uh, which I also had the chance to see. Uh, for some reason, we were just in New York to, at the time, and we we had the privilege. And you turn your own 
neighborhood into a shtetl so that <laughs> right so you basically you told me that you did this so you could have an excuse to 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 meet your neighbors right and to work with them yeah and, and at the center were five uh not five there were a, a number of kids from the drug treatment program um, who performed for the first time. It was the same mix of just neighbors. The UPS man was in it. You know, uh, my mom was in it. And, um, and really beautiful professional dancers and musicians. So, so let's that, watch the clip and then let's watch okay. the clip and then we'll talk about it because okay. I do like the interrelationship with, with what you're doing here and, with, and, and how Ivya informs it. So, so tell just for the audience that tell us about the story of Demeter, the myth, and, and what you, how you translated it to um, the Lower East Side. The myth, the myth is the story of the seasons. And my daughter was about to go to college, Ariel. Mm -hmm. um, this was right after Ivia, and I, you know I, it was earth shattering for me. And I really didn't know the kids in the neighborhood, and I was feeling like. You know, um, like she was going to the underworld or something. So, so I just, and I was, you know, I was devoted. The crops were going to fail and all this. And so, you know, I took kind of the Greek myth. And, you know, I'd, early on I'd worked with Gene Erdman and Joseph Campbell, the theater of the open eye. And I took my myths and my early Martha Graham. I took the myths very seriously. And, um, yeah, so, so we retold it with um, the Lower East Side kind of flair. And... Um, Again, you know, this is seasonal. You only have a certain amount of time to rehearse, you know, because, and then you, you perform this thing and huge amounts of people came. Then now they, this was before gentrification. So it, people who would have never come here came, just like in Ivia, people who never would have come, ever, ever, nobody would ever go to Ivia. Mm -hmm. um, yet all those people came. Um, you know, and the neighbors got very entrepreneurial. They were baking pies and selling them in the middle of the piece. You know, it was, everything was fine. And um, again, the wonderful music of Frank and Ivia and, you know, and here we also had wonderful music. Bill Rule did the music. Um, there's something about that that unites unites it and lets that chaos, you know, chaos work. But but it was a me like mentoring project. It was these uh, professionals mentored the the group that just came out of NYU that were my students. They were a band, and then the band mentored the kids from the drug treatment program, and the kids from the drug treatment program mentored the the six year old girls in their communion dresses. So there was, you know, I, I couldn't have possibly handled the whole thing. It was true chaos. We had to have police, and um, you know, not you know, we had to cordon off the streets. It, I just when I think about these things, Aaron, I cannot believe they came true. I mean, there's so many, uh, so many pitfalls and so many difficulties and, you know, whatever. But, well, yeah, but, but you, yeah. but you, you continue to like push, you keep pushing <laughs> the, the boundaries and you keep 
integrating art into like daily life too. Like here you are on the streets of the Lower East Side, and and you keep and you also have these themes, these threads that are running through from from India to Ivia to New York, where both both how, how does art fit into our lives, but also how do you discover, it's, it's a, your own self-discovery that you're doing, We're, and we get to go along with you, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. first you're trying to understand your family, and I do wanna take a moment to talk about this. Like when you start with this project, Nivia, and you tell us that you really didn't know that your family was involved with the Holocaust. And it's so kind of ironic because you then create this piece that then inspires me to create Yiddishkeit, which becomes this whole thing about celebrating this. But you didn't actually grow up uh, with that kind of, of Yiddish culture or even yeah. that, that sense of it. But, but tell us, just tell, give, let's just take a minute to talk about that. Sure, sure. So my mother was from Bessarabia, she, which is Moldova now, and she was brought up by governesses. It was not a shtetl at all. And she went to Palestine because her father went as a tourist and decided to bring his family, not because they had to go. And, you know, my grandmother arrived with all her linens and beautiful things. And, um, and my mother then um, went to Geneva to college and met my father, who, you know, was in Berlin, but then transferred. Uh, and, but my, uh, but... <laughs> I think that so, and she was so she was a very, um, you know, uh, she, she we were all, we were definitely Jewish, but she was not practicing in in any way. She was very secular. My father had been bar mitzvahed and had come from a very very um, pious family. My great grandfather, who died in Ivia, came here for my father's bris early in the 1912 or 14 or something, and went back to Ivia because New York was not Jewish enough and therefore perished though. I mean, you know, I mean, he could have brought the whole, okay, well, we're Jewish. My yeah. father, I do believe, hid, hid from us. He didn't want us, he thought it was dangerous to be Jewish. This is what I feel. Mm -hmm. And so we never joined a synagogue and, but we had those holidays. We had Hanukkah and we had Pesach and, you know, Rosh Hashanah. And so the religion was around the holidays. And, but I got a glimpse from my grandfather who, when I was a little kid, used to take me to shul, you know, and so I could, I mean, it's such a sense memory of the davening and the singing and then playing cards in the Jewish center. <laughs> so that's where that comes from. That, that card that's game very Jewish. Yeah, yeah, that's what we yeah. do. I mean, what do we know? For me, Jewish is what my parents did and who they were. And, you know, because I never really had formal training. And um, so I make things up all the time. I, I do for my, for my grandchildren, of which I have four, I do something that my son calls a faux mitzvah. But I think it's a real mitzvah <laughs> because, and I take them when they're 13 and bring them to my house and show them the Ivia movie <laughs> just to make sure that they know. And then they write us, then we invite the family the next day. They present their speech and they, they, they give their presence to whatever charitable thing. And there's something, the essence of it, um, without the Hebrew school. Um, but but for me, it's taking what my parents gave me, gave me, enhancing it, and letting it live and breathe, um, you know, through the other generations. And so, yeah, so that's, I just, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do go, um, there was a wonderful rabbi, uh, Ellen Lippman, from the, the, the shul Kolot Hayenu in Brooklyn. She was my advisor to, for the Avia Project. And every time I suggested something, she had a big biblical reference. <laughs> uh, you know, I was like, "You're you're right, Tamar. You're absolutely right. I had no idea why I started that." But you know, um, she, the the crown on the Sabbath bride, the first image, uh -huh. she it is made out of challah bread, and it's the bread is intertwined because she told me that on the Sabbath you're supposed to have sex. <laughs> so that's what the 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 Sabbath bride had the intertwining of the challah bread. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't, 
ever wish that it was any different? I don't know if what my parents gave me is Jewish. You know, we had great education. Ah, there's the Sabbath ride. Yeah, and as Aaron knows, as soon as I got home, I wanted to have a Jewish wedding because my first wedding, my husband wanted to be ethical culture wedding, which is what his family was. And when I saw that Sabbath bride, every single performance, I just wished that's who I was. So wait, wait, I, did you know about the Sabbath bride before you? I mean, how did you even get that idea in your head if you weren't? The rabbi, the, the rabbi, the rabbi said, "Oh, I there's mean, this thing, the Sabbath." I, I discussed a lot of things with mm -hmm. her about these scenes. Oh, and, so then you and you then you visualize it because I had heard of you know I I did I, as the audience or may or may not know I was not raised in in a traditional Jewish home either but I had I knew about the concept of the Sabbath bride and to watch when when you recreated the Sabbath bride literally coming out of the field and like let, let's just watch this clip first and then we're going to come back to this like so let's watch the Sabbath bride clip from from the Abbey project <laughs> Das, was da ist vorgekommen, in 1941, in 1942, in Jahren, ist das da gegangen durch mein Herz oder das Salz. Ich habe da gewinnt vom ersten Tag bis zum letzten. Alle Eden, aufgetrieben, in meinem Ort, Intelligenten, ich weiß nicht, ist das Menschen, Lehrer, Doktorin, Advokaten, Juristen. Tak, to pierwsza była tura. Drugą turę. To jest pierwsza. To jest kiedy było. To już później było na przez zimę. Powiedzieli, że brać się wszystkim pod kościół. U siostry mojej dom, okna akurat na tą drogę. My schodzili, pochodziliśmy na, na, na nawóz wyrzucać, bo to wiosna żyła. W ten dzień, na tego maja, był bardzo silny wiatr i tak dmuchał tę pyl, tak było rozdzielone, że słabo było widać za pylem, a ludzie szli, a to było ciepło. Akurat kwitli jabłonie. Ale widzimy, że tata to wiesili w oknach i ranko. Powiedzieli, że w oknach zawiesić, ale my przecież ranko wszystko widzieli. I pamiętam, jak dziś o przyciągam, jak Loja stary, jak sami wysoki, samego brzegu szedł. I tak rodzinami, rodzinami. So it's so interesting for me just to think about it, because you're you're continuing to explore, to understand who your father was and who your father's family was. And then you create this piece and you have that sensory, literally enter into it and you allow all of us to enter into it. And then it impacts your life. You come back and you say like, I wanna be, I wanna look like the Sabbath, I want my <laughs> wedding, to, I wanna be this, the, the, that bride. Yeah. Um, it was so, so nice you, that Frank London played at my wedding, the Klesmatics. Do we do we have a wedding picture? Your your first and oh, second I hope wedding? Not. I hope not. <laughs> no, I think we do. Oh, there it is. Oh, so there, yeah. <laughs> Costumed again, and this is your second with with our with your children there now because this your, is your second yeah. wedding. Well, to the same guy, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but now a Jewish one, and I mean, do you, has. Did, did have you change your own sense of your Jewish identity, or or your own sense of your own identity? Still, I mean, yes, it changed me, okay? It changed me because I had to accept something that was so deeply sorrowful. Mm. And I had to accept it, not from a distance, you know? I mean, even to understand that the man who was just talking to you about how it went through his heart, mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to hear... I wanted to hear the story of how he buried himself on the day so he wouldn't be taken. 
but then he was found and he was made to bury his family. I, mean, I, I don't even want to start to say, but I, I kind of couldn't take that without learning <laughs> with everybody's arms around me, you know, mm -hmm. which is what how it happened. Um, there was, uh, you know, it changed me to realize certainly the power of art. To, to understand that after the project, people never left. And they didn't clap, which is so crazy in the Soviet you know, part of the world. They always clap for a million encores, but no one clapped. And they came out, and everybody talked to each other. There were people who said, you know, we had Jews. And they, the conversations. So I was like, I never can answer things too much about my identity. It's just not fully formed, you know. It's, it's still happening. But it was something about... Um, ab about what, how art does and can communicate and also how respectful you have to be in this process mm -hmm. and how much you, you yeah, and, and sort of for me the hierarchy of what's important. Like, I didn't like to put a lot of dances in the Ivia project because I never wanted someone to say, oh, now this is a dance. Oh, now they're dancing. Um, so I had to figure out language things that could, made the story move. So just for me as an artist, which is my identity, um, and also, of course, me as a, as a parent, one of the hardest things that happened during that time was um, when you saw Ariel take the trumpet from the wall. Well, right before then, the whole cast had stood up behind the wall and we saw everybody that we had gotten to know in the forest uh, in the last scene. And then they just lowered themselves and they were gone. And um, my son came to see the project. If Ariel was 16, he was maybe uh, 21. And I said, well, Josh, would you like to step in and, you know, just be in it? And there's a smoking scene he did. But I didn't realize that at the end he was going to be on the other side of the wall with the people that didn't make it. Mm. And Ariel was on my side of the wall, the people mm. who did make it. And it was, it was the most graphic, uh, you know, heartbreak um, to realize, you know, um, that it was just kids just like my kids. It, yeah. it was like, yeah. yeah. So, so I think as an artist, you know, I... I find the things that I found in the Ivia project need to inform and continue to inform because there was a power in them and you have to stand by that and say, why was that? Um, and uh, yeah. So then from, from there, I mean, you, you, you go and you, can, you, you explore through Daughter of a Pacifist Soldier, your, your fa uh, continue just to explore your father and his PTSD and what that that greater understanding and then you're exploring your neighborhood with Demeter's daughter and getting and, and your your own daughter leaving how does and then you create a movie like <laughs> you create this incredible film enter the fawn so let's talk about that because again what happens is that you continue to grow as an artist and that's what one of the reasons I respect you so much is that you don't just sit on your laurels and, and do the same thing over and over again you keep pushing the boundaries um, so here you're like, let, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about what? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I have an enormous interest in the body. Um, just have, you know, having to do with my father being a, a doctor of rheumatoid arthritis, having seen, you know, from the age of re just the minute I opened my eyes, there were people in my house, you know, who had arthritis and rheumatism, serious illnesses. And, um, but I, I, I look to my body, um, I, I create something called body scripting, which we don't really have time for, but, but anyway, um, well, I'm interested in bit. bodies. Let's okay. A little I'm bit really, about body scripting. Okay. Body scripting is how I choreograph most of the time. Sometimes not, but let's say I, I make a script of the, you know, the left the left clavicle, you know, uh, the space between the fingers. And the dancers or the performers will go clavicle. And what it is, is you focus on the place, you designate the place, you focus on it, and then you explore it. You, you know, kind of excavate around it. 
And so you learn directly from the from the body. You go mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. So I, I I've been teaching a laboratory class in New York for forty years um, now online, mm -hmm. um, and it, it all is every single class. Whoops! <laughs> I just uh, every single class I learn something absolutely startlingly mm -hmm. new every class. Mm -hmm. So my, I saw um, this performance um, of Romeo and Juliet with uh, theater breaking through uh, barriers. It was called, and I saw Greg Mosgala, who has cerebral palsy, he's an actor with cerebral palsy, and um, I was fascinated by his performance. I was fascinated by how the power of his body and his expression. Let's show the thing, <laughs> and yeah, you'll see. Let's, let's watch this clip. <laughs> I first saw Greg in a performance of Romeo and Juliet. I was completely blown away by the power of his very particular physicality. There's always just some sort of level of like low grade tension. You made your body work for you. It was energetic and cool, special in the way that no one walks like that. I said there's different intelligences in the body. I didn't have anything else to do, so I was like, well, okay, I'll show up. It was like leaning onto a sandcastle and having it absolutely crumble away. Mm -hmm. Balance issues. Go down another inch on the hump. Oh, well, okay, you're okay. She said, just do this thing called shaking for 15 or 20 minutes. And, and after a couple minutes of doing this, I was feeling things that I had never felt before. and something happened. Once I stood up and took my first steps, I knew something had changed. My feet are on the floor. To be able to feel the earth with my whole foot, that's so new to me. I know what the tension in the body feels like. It's a brutality. Isn't this amazing? This guy can just walk. All the years of physical therapy, doctors, specialists are left behind me. My body is capable of something miraculous and transcendent. And then it stopped being amazing. Like shock waves of physical terror coursing through my body. The Fawn was a mythological character. He was a boundary breaker. My body is in this state of constant fear. The disability was a thing. These movements are not mine. I feel like I've lost something. It's too confusing. The Fawn was a worship for the idea that people don't need to be bound by convention. Oh, to the top. Yeah. I don't want to go through this. But if anybody had the option, they'd take it. It's just amazing. I mean, I, uh, like what you just did, just watching that, and I saw the whole film too, but I, I remember being so blown away, like you changed this person's way of relating to his own body, how about how he moved. And, yeah. and did that, and did, and I believe, well, I don't, I'll just let you say something here before I go further. Well, I mean, I had worked with a lot of alignment and I'd worked with bones and muscles, you know, over the years, trying to figure it out experientially. And I not really understood the nervous system and either did he. And together mm -hmm. we kind of, we met every day. We worked every day for a year to prepare him to do this. Again, this was a live performance and a film as in a documentary film, you know, partnering with it. So, you know, it was like, uh, I just used everything that I ever knew and felt so totally at ease and comfortable to try things. And, uh, and he was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, partner for me. Um, I'm not, you know, it maybe it sounds and feels a little easy. It certainly was not an easy thing. Um, but it was very revelatory and, um, uh, yeah, and, and surprising. And so it, that was a big transformation, you know. Um, it's like, that's almost like 
so many different directions for me. There's mm -hmm. stories to tell, mm -hmm. and there's stories in the body. My very first piece was called Migrations, a story through the body, a dance through the body, with a big picture of a skeleton. And yeah, and I, I love, you know, I love the map of the body. I love the sternum. I love the clavicle. I mean, I have invested so much time in this in 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 my my actual body and in teaching because mm -hmm. I don't really do well alone. So for me, I, I I do best in community. So my classes, you know, we all work together. We work we work. Um, I introduce the ideas and do improvisations in different ways. They explore with me. And this has been the most amazing life lesson. Uh, it just never stops. There's just so much to learn about the body and uh, and in ways that help people. Um, and you know a lot of a lot of uh, I have people in my class with disabilities and um, and I don't have a lot of dancers because dancers don't really want to do it this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a lot of actors. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Buddhists in my class. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> well, it's an incredible, like the transformation that that this actor went through. And I'm wondering, did did other people with cerebral palsy come to you and say, like, work with me, or did this inspire? Uh, did this inspire any? Was there a ripple effect from this as well? Um, well, the idea was for Greg to teach. And mm -hmm. which he did. He 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 took. I mean, because he shared a nervous system with the people he was teaching, which was mm -hmm. in some ways, yeah, really mm -hmm. helpful. Um, yes, a lot of people from all over the world because this play piece got so much publicity, so much in the New York Times, so much on uh, news programs and uh, Sunday morning program, all, all these things. And um, so people re were reaching out. It was like really hard because that's not my my life, isn't mm -hmm. to do that. Um, uh, so, but I got to write about it for some medical magazines. Doctors were really interested, which is so interesting to me, um, because it's rare that you see a result with cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. that you see a change. Um, yeah, so I, I learned to be a little more articulate about um, talking and to talk mm -hmm. to doctors, mm -hmm. but they, I didn't talk their language. They had to learn my mm -hmm. language. You know, so it's, it's so it's like again you 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 have this ripple effect or your work you and your work have this amazing ripple effect. I mean, so you create this piece that you're exploring in Ivia, and then it impacts me, and then I create this thing which impacts all these thousands of people and in ways. But you also and then you work with this 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 actor, and then that changes the way people with cerebral palsy and people with disabilities see the, their bodies. But you also worked. Um, with Claire Danes and on Temple Grandin. And so that had, had you know, I guess I don't think that the audience knows just how big of an impact you've had, not just on <laughs> on these maybe niche cultures and things, but on in popular culture as well. Yeah, so I'm actually, about that. yeah, I consider my, for actors, I'm, I'm um, you know, I can be consulted as a body um, person. And uh, Claire had to play Temple Grandin and there's no two different bodies you couldn't find two more different bodies and um, and I got to prepare her every day in the studio for like I don't know six weeks and I actually got to meet Temple Grandin um, just to check in with her to see if what we were doing was okay with her um, and it was one of the most interesting days of my life um, you know I would Claire would show her something and she'd say I didn't do that but you can do that or she'd I did that, but you can't do that. You, mm -hmm. I didn't do you, but so clarity. So I was just like, okay, we can do this, we can do so very clear. And Claire is amazing. Um, she has amazing physical knowledge. Uh, I've done two works for her. I did a solo for her, um, and a duet with Ariel, because they're friends. And so this is a body scripting thing. Mm -hmm. She was able to mm -hmm. do this. I mean, if Claire, uh, you know, her back is shaped like this and her chin is up, I had to change her whole carriage. What I did was take her rib cage and bring it closer to her pelvis. Mm. And that, 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 that changed her whole feeling of being in her body. And um, 
yeah, I, I, I worked on uh, a few other films and with actors and just using this, this very simple um, technique of, of naming parts of the body for them to focus on. Uh, that's, yeah, so that, that was, uh, yeah, that was a, a very, very wonderful um, experience because Claire did get her Emmy and, um, and she told a story, a very, very important story. And we, we all heard of Temple. During working with Greg during the, the fawn, um, oh my God, it just blanked. Um, I'm trying to remember who, who came to the studio. My husband's going to run in and he's going to tell me. <laughs> tell me. <laughs> Somebody came to the studio who yeah, was yeah, yeah. super famous. And... Yeah, the greatest neurologist that ever lived. Oh, came. Oliver Sacks? Or... Yes, that's who came. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yes, really. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he has probably, well, anyway, uh, yes, he came to see what I was doing with Greg. And, oh, my God. Um, he said Greg was definitely going to be the next Mijinsky, um, the next cerebral palsy Mijinsky. And wow. he said to me, and you are going to learn a lot. <laughs> well, Both of things were true. So, yeah, right. Well, you know, from Joseph Campbell to Martha Graham to Oliver Sacks, you have quite a through point. Um, I do. I want to like, uh, finish with your, um, with your latest film, Circles of Avenue C. Uh, and you're, you continue to be this prolific um, creator and artist. And so that it clearly is. So tell us about this, this, this latest project. Well, it's very uh, related to COVID actually. Um, I just wanted to get out in my neighborhood and um, to, to be more playful on the street than we'd been. And to sort of, because I actually thought of doing it in that last summer when everything was lifting and feeling like it was almost over. And um, so that was, again, a little opportunity moment. And, and so I just uh, brought together people in my neighborhood um, and people in my building where I live and gen different generations, um, all of it. I think we should just, there's a one minute um, sort of promo that you can show. Uh, and it, th this one I have just finished. It's a short, it's not a full length film. Yo te veré en lugares familiares que mi corazón abraza todo el tiempo en el pequeño café el parque que soleamos Los pinos y la fuente de los deseos Al piscino Every lovely summer's day Every pretty That is so beautiful. <laughs> and is, is, when is that coming out? I'm waiting to hear from film festivals now. Mm. And how long of a short, how long is it? It's 29 minutes. That is so beautiful what we just saw. And again, it's, I, I feel, I feel an absolute through point with all of your work. I mean, connecting to streets, bringing art out into our, into our world. I mean, did you work here also with professional, uh, clearly with the- Yeah, uh, it's the same. It's the same mix that I love so much. Mm -hmm. And you know, Demeter was on 9th Street and uh, the Circles of Avenue C was on 11th Street and Avenue C. So, you know, I like took another chunk of the neighborhood to, mm -hmm. to meet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just the, the generational thing to have people, of at least, you know, the three generations, mm -hmm. to have the mix of professional um, performers and neighborhood people. Um, you know, during Ivia, the, the actors, the professional actors said that having standing that window scene where they stood by, there was one Holocaust survivor and one professional actor. My idea is you don't block the, you don't let the person who's not an actor 
worry about blocking, but the actor then knows exactly how to get them where they need to be. Um, and the actor said, you know, being next to that reality was the hardest thing that a professional actor could do. Mm. You know? And, and uh, so it's the, it's a similar, it's, it's that energy of community. It's that energy of people of all ages and different states of knowledge and what do children know that we don't know and what do mm -hmm. older people know. And, um, you know, in this one there was, uh, yeah, there was a marriage that, um, yeah. So for me, <laughs> I have no idea what I'll do next. And I'm laughing because... I can't believe, Aaron, that we went through so much material. I'm so pleased that we did. Um, oh, my, it's just, you know, it's, what's amazing to me is how much I learned about you uh, in the process of leading up to this interview and, and how inspiring your work is and how you, like, just like with the clip that we just saw, I mean, you brought us back to Ivya with the, the joy and the grief and how you, I mean, I didn't actually realize it was um, until you said it, like, that it was all about this moment about COVID. And, and then I understood it in a whole different way. I had just watched the clip before without thinking about that. And it, yeah, it's, it, it's so timely and it's so much about where we are right now. Uh, and um, I want to bring Robbie uh, Adler Pecker back into the conversation because we are nearing the end. But he's, um, Robbie, what did you think? Wait, wait, you're, I, we don't hear you. I don't hear you. Oh, sorry, I was muted. There you are. Um, uh, yeah, it's incredible to watch. Uh, the One of the things that struck me the most watching this whole discussion was just the way that so much from that one point of inspiration at Nivea continues to resonate, but it also, the work that we continue to do, and you know, Aaron selected me to come out here to be the director of this organization. I think because of this, uh, the deep alignment with the way that you have, uh, you, this path that was set forward there in Eastern Europe, but continues in all of these different directions to resonate in so much that we do. One of the things that I was so struck by just at that last in seeing circles of Avenue C was the that joining up of grief and joy or joy that follows the grief um, and what it meant to come out into the streets after these years of these two years of COVID of being locked in and uh, of lockdowns and of, of disconnect. And then seeing the ways that the community can come together and be filled with joy and movement. And that's so much also about what we're doing here, I think, in terms of not only about Jewish culture, but exploring the links to other communities, seeing the ways that joy and, and grief can be intertwined or one can follow another and not overshadow the other all the time. And it's just brilliant to watch this body of work of yours. And then also just to think about that the way that it uh, has such a deep impact on everything that we continue to do here at Yiddishkeit. It's just such a joy to watch. Body of work and the work of the body. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I really love how you talked about body scripting and how, you know, you're, you're exploring your own body. And through that, you're exploring this map that you give peop other people that atlas or that the, the, you kind of give them a path and you did that, you do it viscerally also in all of your pieces too, where we, you, you allow us in and you give us a new path forward and, and you kind of chart a new chart forward. Like, like you can go explore these other territories. And I just want to thank you for that um, amazing map that you've given me and, um, and to so many thousands of others out there. Mm. So, so welcome, and I, so, I really appreciate that after all this time we get to, to talk about this again in, in retrospect. Yeah, and I, I, I wish I could be with you in person because I actually can feel phys the physicality of you and not being in the same room <laughs> is really uh, poignant right now, you know, yeah. after this whole discussion of, of, and here we are all, ex and, and I love the way we can experience this um, viscerally and digitally, but I also miss that connection that and, and the things that you do um, in real time, in real space uh, are just so powerful and also in continue to inspire me in my work. I, I, I knew about site specific work, but like, and I had an idea of it and I had produced a little bit of it, but after seeing Ivy, I did, I've spent a lifetime doing a, a site specific work. So thank you. And thank you so much for the interview you did with Frank London, because that was really beautiful. I mean, he, 
he's so much a part of the Avia project, and um, I thought your interview was wonderful. Well, thank you. And you know, this is this is going to your this, the trio of starting with Michael Alpert, and then Frank, and then you. Now that's going to close the my interviews to mark the 25th anniversary of Yiddishkeit. Two years. Of, it took us two years to finish it. <laughs> uh, we're now we're now. This is because. Ivia was 28 years ago, uh, yeah. so it, it took May it took three years to finish it. So thank you very much, and I, I think we're at time. And this was just amazing, and I'm hoping that thousands of people will get to see this as well and experience your genius because that's what it is. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you both. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Tamar, and also thanks to all, everyone behind the scene, to Lisa uh, Grissom and to Claire Fester for all your work behind the scenes and putting all this together and making this possible. Thank you all, and thank you all for joining us, and have a great night. Thank you. And a good Pesach. Feilchen Pesach. <laughs>